great God. Amen. In every form and fashion, we serve a great God. Turn to the book of Daniel tonight, if you would. The book of Daniel, chapter 3. And tonight, we want to talk about our faith. Talk about our faith. Daniel, chapter 3, tonight. The verses that we're going to cover, we're not going to read them all, but uh, we're going to look at Daniel from... Uh, Daniel 3 from verse 10 through verse 30. And we're just going to look at some different verses tonight as we talk about uh, our faith. The story of uh, the children of Israel carried off into Babylon, carried away into captivity. Uh, It is a story that we read about. We read about Uh, the uh, three Hebrew children, we read about Daniel and uh, different stories of where God's people paid a terrible price for their disobedience. Now the Bible tells us that there are consequences for sin, amen? And God's people uh, paid the consequences for their sin. But just because they had sinned, God didn't throw them away. God didn't just wad them up and say, well, I'm done with you. God had a process. He he, he sent them through a time of captivity. But God also had a plan for them later on. And when we look in Daniel chapter 3 tonight, in this story it tells us that King Nebuchadnezzar builds an idol that is 90 feet tall, 90 feet tall. Uh, We don't have anything in here that we can measure. I'm saying probably this ceiling uh, is getting somewhere around 20 uh, 20 to 25 foot at the the crest. So you can imagine uh, this humongous idol that King Nebuchadnezzar Uh, had built. It was nine feet wide, overlaid with gold, and it sat on this huge pedestal that was over a hundred foot square. Anywhere that it would have sat out on the plain, it would have towered over anything and everything else that would have been in front of it. A lot of the Bible scholars believe that Nebuchadnezzar had this Uh, idol built in his image because he wanted to be looked at as a God. Often when you study kings, not not, not just the kings in the Bible, but but various kings of history, uh, they'd done things and they had things built that would resemble them or would be a symbol of them because they wanted to be looked at uh, as a God. Uh, In Daniel, the book of Daniel, we read the story about the three Hebrew boys, the Jewish boys, who were taken captive by the Babylonians. In chapter 1, we read about how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to eat the king's meat because it went against uh, the laws, the Levitical law, the kosher laws. Sometimes when you hear... um, Uh, Jews talk about something being kosher. They're talking about it being uh, uh, food that agreed with the Levitical law. When we go on our trips over to Israel, uh, food is served kosher, uh, meaning that you cannot necessarily order food like you would order it over here. Uh, They do not mix dairy with beef and things of that nature. So you don't go into a McDonald's and order a cheeseburger. You say, well, Brother Tim, I I, I really like McDonald's cheeseburgers, so what do I do? You go up to the the counter and you order you a cheeseburger or, or order you a hamburger. And then they'll serve you the hamburger. Then you go back to your table and you sit down and then you get up and you go back through the line and you order a slice of cheese and you go back to your table and you put your own cheese on your own burger, right? But they're not going to serve it to you that way because that breaks the Levitical law. So in Daniel chapter 1, the Bible says that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had brought these young men into his palace for the sole purpose of trying to train them, to change them, to convert them Uh, He knew that they were smart. He wanted to use their intelligence. He wanted to use their talents. 
uh, for, for his purpose, for his kingdom. And so in chapter 1, they refuse to eat the king's meat. In chapter 3, they refuse to bow down to this idol that King Nebuchadnezzar has built, 90 foot high, 9 foot wide, sitting on a 100 foot base, and they refuse to bow down uh, to uh, this idol. And we know the story of what happens. The Bible says that they were cast into the fiery furnace, and uh, God miraculously delivered them uh, from the, uh, the punishment that Nebuchadnezzar was trying to put upon them. And then we read in chapter 6 about Daniel. See, Daniel was one of those young Jewish boys that had been taken away uh, captive as well to Babylon. And we read about how Daniel refused to stop what? Praying. Uh, they, they decided they didn't like Daniel and so they tricked the king into passing the law and signing the decree that you cannot pray and you know that you cannot pray to any other gods but their gods and so on and so forth. And the Bible says that Daniel went back to his room and he'd done the exact same thing as he had done every other day. He had opened up his window toward Jerusalem toward the temple mount and that he would pray. And the Bible said they caught him praying and so they take him and they throw him in the lion's den and uh, God miraculously uh, spares David's life and, and he comes forward out of the lion's den. The king and his men are doing everything that they can. When you read through these first few chapters of the book of Daniel, these men are trying to do everything that they can do to convert these guys. The Jewish young men were very intelligent. Even today, my friend, a lot of the technology that we have in our world comes from Israel. Uh, how many of you have a cell phone? Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. So I'm looking around and I'm going to say that's probably 99.5% of the people in this room. The very technology for the very first tel uh, uh, cell phones came out of Israel. A lot of military tactics that our military uses today came out of Israel. Uh, most medics in the military right now and a lot of hospitals and even ambulances call, uh, they carry this stuff called quick clot. And uh, it is a medicine that is used to stop bleeding uh, out on the battlefield. If a soldier gets shot, it's important to try to stop the bleeding as soon as possible. And uh, you know, we, we had all these different things, tourniquets and so on and so forth. A number of years ago, the Israeli army, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, they came out with stuff uh, that was uh, uh, approved for the battlefield so that they can apply it directly there on the spot and it will stop the bleeding uh, of their soldiers. God has blessed the Jewish people with a tremendous amount of intelligence. And Nebuchadnezzar saw this in these young men and he was wanting to use their talents. He was wanting to use uh, the gifts that they had to help advance his kingdom. And so the king and his men are doing everything that they can to try to convert these young men over and to get them to compromise their faith and their beliefs so that they will be a part of them. There is a tremendous amount of pressure being applied by Nebuchadnezzar and his inner circle to get these young Jewish boys to, to go against their faith, to go against their beliefs, against their God, and accept their culture, the Babylonian culture, to accept the, the, their beliefs, their way of doing things, their diet, just all of it. They wanted to convert every uh, thing about them so that they could use them for their own good. You say, well, Brother Tim, how were they trying to convert them? How were they trying to break these young men? In chapter 1, we find that they were using education. In chapter 1, verse 4, they were using the education to try to break these young men. Can I tell you that in our world that we're living today, the world is still trying to use education to break people of their faith and their belief in God. 
Now, we have, a, we have a great school system here. We have a tremendous amount of people in our church that work in the school system. We got some great Christian teachers and workers and, and, and people in our school. But as a whole, the Christian education, and especially at the college level, the devil is still trying to use education in order to get young people to compromise their faith and their beliefs. We hear it all the time. We see it happen all the time. We hear parents all the time who say, I sent little Johnny or little Susie off to college and they come back and they are a totally different person. Their beliefs are different. Their thoughts are different. The way that they look at, at our country, the way that they look at religion and everything is different. I'm going to tell you why. It is because there is a secular educational movement out there to move our kids away from biblical beliefs and biblical traditions and from the word of God and to try to get them to compromise what they believe. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here tonight or stand here tonight and make a, a, a pitch for Welch College. Welch College is, is it's a college that is owned by Free Will Baptist. This church right here owns a piece of Welch College uh, there in Nashville. But I want you to understand tonight, friend, that uh, in the educational system, that there is a price to be paid. And, and if we send our kids off to secular colleges, we cannot be surprised when they come back with secular ideas. Would you say amen to that? If you're going to send them to a college that has professors and a system that is anti-biblical, that is set up to teach them the things against God and to teach them that they but, you know that they were slime that crawled up out of the ocean, or that there are you know they're a monkey or whatever. You know that they come from a gorilla, and you know I never really believed that till I went to one of my family reunions, and I thought, well, Matt, that's got a little bit of validity to it. I'm telling you, just a couple of them look like they kind of fell out of a tree there. But if you send your kids off to places like that, you can't be surprised if they come back with those kind of beliefs. That's why I'm a firm believer for those that are able to do it. And I know not everybody is able, but a good Christian education and doing everything that you can as, as parents and as grandparents to teach your children, to train your children, uh, it is not simply the school system's job, regardless whether it is secular uh, or religious, it is not their sole purpose to educate your child. As a parent, as a grandparent, you are given responsibility to help raise up and to train and to teach your children the things of God and the church should say amen to that. But we not only see that they were trying to break their faith and their beliefs through education, but they were trying to break them through the social life that they were in. Understand that there were a number of the Jewish people that were brought into captivity in Babylon who was put to hard labor. There was a number of them who were considered threats that were taken off and put in prison. There are a number of these Jewish people that when they come into Babylon, they didn't have things necessarily uh, as well as others. But again, Nebuchadnezzar and his group realizes among some of these young men, there are tremendous amount of talent. And so what do they do? They surround those young men with other young men of their age of the same ideas and beliefs as far as um, you know, just what young people believe and that kind of thing and surrounded them with that and tried their best to get them to cave to their beliefs and their faith by social pressure. Now again, this is one of those rhetorical questions that you don't have to uh, lift your hand tonight, but how many of you tonight have ever been pressured by somebody in a social group somewhere to do something you know that you shouldn't do? How many of you tonight have been in a situation where people around you have put pressure on you to compromise your faith in God or to compromise your beliefs or to get you to doubt what is in God's word, to get you to do something that necessarily wasn't the smartest thing to do? Now, this is not a rhetorical question. I want you to raise your hand tonight. How many here in this room tonight's done something dumb? 
Seriously, some of you not going to raise your hand? All right, I'll preach online next week. I'll tell you a story that we done, not a story, I'll tell you something we done one time. Living up in Greenville in high school, we had a football game. And uh, there were times when, when, when we played football that we had to ride the bus. But every once in a while, after a ball game, the coach would let us ride home with someone else that he thought was uh, mature enough to make sure that we got home. Well, one night after a ball game, there were some of the, some of the guys, you know, we'd, we'd played the game and stuff, and, and uh, we were wanting to ride home with one of our friends, and so the coach was like, okay, you guys can go, and there was five of us. And so we jumped in the car. Well, one of the guys that was riding with us was a royal pain in the neck, all right? He was bugging us. He was going on with a bunch of junk and everything. And we kept threatening him, if you don't stop, if you don't quit, we're going to put you in the trunk. You're going to ride home in the trunk. Now, where we, where we played to home was probably about an hour's drive. He wouldn't quit. We pulled over. We opened the trunk. And it wasn't the, one of those trunks back in the, like you have nowadays with all the carpet and the little escape hatch handle and all that stuff that glows in the dark. It wasn't none of that stuff. If you locked in the trunk, you locked in the trunk. And you're in the trunk back there with the spare tire and all that other. You know what I'm talking about? That's what you used to carry in the trunk, right? So he wouldn't stop his stuff. So we stopped the car. We jerked him out. We threw him in the trunk. We shut the lid and we headed down the road. He's in the back of the trunk and he's beating and he's banging and he's hollering, let me out of here, get me out of here. Well, the guy that was driving went over every pothole, every bump that he could find. He would find railroad tracks. We would go over those railroad tracks. We'd do everything we could. We could hear him around, bouncing around, going on, doing that thing. But in the process of doing all of that dumb stuff, we got the attention of a local police officer. That local police officer felt the need to pull us over. We're sitting there, the four of us, we're sitting there in, the, in that car and we are sweating because we have just, in, I guess in some cases or some way, we may have kidnapped this guy and put him in the trunk of a car. So when the police officer walks up to the window and is talking to us or whatever, the only thing we're thinking is, please let him just lay back there and shut up. Let him, please don't let him say anything because we're going to be here a long time if we have to open that trunk and that boy crawls out of that trunk. <laughs> so we sit there, that, you know, the officer asks his questions, he does whatever, and he says, all right, boys, y'all go on, so don't y'all be getting in any, any, any trouble. Yes, sir, absolutely. We're not going to get in any trouble whatsoever. And so we pull off and we get down the road a little ways. We made sure to go over another good railroad track to give him another good bump. And we pull off and we open the trunk. And that boy, I promise you, he looks like he's been beat with a stick. He's been bounced all over that trunk in the back of that car. So we were laughing about it at this point. And it's like, why didn't you say anything? When, you, when we got pulled over, when we stopped, he said, you know, you'd been beaten on the, on the trunk and all that stuff. He said, I could see the blue lights blinking through the back of the car. He said, I knew we were getting pulled over. And he said, I was scared to death back there in that truck. And, and so were we. So he didn't say a word. But let me tell you, the next time we rode home from a football game, he was the best. I'm telling you what, he behaved himself. That ride home in that trunk taught him a lesson. Amen. And it taught the rest of us, too, if we was going to act like a fool, we might end up back in the trunk. So there are times when we do some crazy things because the people around us have influence on us. And we find in the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar made sure that these young men were surrounded by other young men, talented, smart uh, young men who would try to uh, use the social life to break them in, to get them to compromise their faith and their beliefs, even in the bowing down um, 
to the statue, the Bible says that when the music was played, that everybody bowed down except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now we know Daniel is somewhere in the process of this as well, but in the story it records for these three young men that they were willing to stand against the social pressure. You go into a social situation and everybody there is doing it, but you, do you not feel pressure to join in? Absolutely. When everybody else is doing it, when everybody else is saying it, when everybody else is going there, young people, listen to what I'm telling you. When your whole school decides that they're going to go do something, if you've got a group of friends and they decide that they're going to go do something stupid, you've got people around you that are making the wrong decisions, going the wrong places, and all of these different things, are you going to have a strong enough faith that you are going to take a stand, that you're going to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bow down. Just because of the social pressure, just because everybody else is doing it, does it mean that I'm going to do it. Not only did Nebuchadnezzar use, use the educational system and the social life system, but he also used the, uh, the legal system. We find in these stories that first of all, Nebuchadnezzar said, he gave the decree, he was the lawmaker. He said, you will bow down. And when Daniel was praying, what did they do? They passed the law that said, you will not pray. They used the, the, the legal system to try to break their faith and their, uh, uh, and their beliefs. We live in a world today where they're doing it all the time. We're, we're living in a society today, friend, where every single day from the national level to the state level to the local level, they're doing everything that they can to try to get us to compromise our faith and our beliefs. They're, they're passing all kinds of laws that you can't do this here, you can't do that there, you can't pray over here, you can't go over here, you can't have a gathering over here, you gotta get a, a, a permit to go over here, you got to, to do, you know, and, and let me just ask you this question. How come is it if you wanna go over here and have about five or 600 people gather for a ball game and they get together, they don't have to have a permit, but if you wanna have a prayer meeting, you gotta go to city council and get a permit. Good question, amen? Why is that? Because the law, the way that the legal system is set up, they are constantly trying to impose upon our religious freedoms and our uh, religious rights. And we find in the word of God that they were trying to use the legal system. I believe everybody in here tonight tries to be a legal, a, a, a legal uh, citizen. In other words, you try to live by the law. Okay, now we all speed and, and, and do some of those kind of things. We're, we're all kind of, uh, you know, just in that thing where we, we do things, you know, the new law where you're not supposed to use the cell phone or whatever in your hand. I'm not even going to ask you how many of you need to repent of that one. How many of you have already broke that one? You know, it started, I think, on July 1st. I think I broke it by dinner time on July 1st. Anybody else in here willing to admit you've broke that law yet? You ain't going to get arrested. You know, so we've already done it. But we try to be law-abiding citizens. We try to do what's right. And our government knows that. They know that most people are going to just simply obey the law, whatever it is, and we're going to, be try, to, we're going to try to be law-abiding citizens. And so what did they do? They started passing laws. They're like, okay, these guys, they like to stick to laws. They like to stick to the rules and all of that. So we're going to make some rules that says that you can't pray. We're going to make some rules that says that you've got to bow down to this 90-foot idol and that you're going to have to honor King Nebuchadnezzar. And you know what these young men did? Now listen, these are not old prophets. These are young Jewish boys, young Jewish men, very impressionable. You know what they done? They said, we'd rather break the law. We would rather pay the penalty. We would rather go against the law than to go against God. Throughout God's word, it reminds us, are we going to please God or are we going to please man? Are we going to be obedient to what God has said or are we going to be obedient to what God has said? 
And so King Nebuchadnezzar and his men are doing everything they can to break down, to cause these young men to compromise their faith and their beliefs, the educational system, uh, social life, the laws that was around them, and even the environment that they were in. Nebuchadnezzar was doing everything that he could to keep them in an environment that would try to push them to compromising their faith in Almighty God. Now, friend, nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. Satan hasn't changed. His tactics hasn't changed. The world is still putting pressure on you, regardless of your age, regardless of your situation. It is constantly putting pressure on you, trying to get you to compromise your beliefs and your faith. Trying to get you to let the gate down. The old ad will say, and you know, once you let the gate down, it's hard to get it back up. Amen? And all the world is doing is trying to let, get us to let the gate down. Just, just let it down just a little bit. Just, just give in a little bit. Just, just try to compromise with us and, and, and play the game a little bit. My friend, you start playing that game and you're going to lose it every single time. These young men won because they were not willing to compromise. They were not willing to give in. And so that comes to this tonight as I'm going to bring this to a close here in just a moment. How important is your faith. If you were faced with the same situations, and you are at times, that these young men were faced with, how important is your faith? Would you be willing to stand for your faith even though you had to go against the educational system? Would you stand for your faith even though everybody else is doing it and you would be the social outcast? Would you will it be willing to stand for your faith even though it would go against the laws that have been created, would you be willing to stand for your faith even though the entire environment that is around you is an ungodly environment and trying to influence you to compromise your faith? My friend, how important is your faith? A personal relationship with God should be our greatest concern. Oh, Brother Tim, that's just church talk. That's just religious rhetoric. No, it's not. It's the reality of the situation. It's the reality of the situation. These young men, what they were facing was not just religious uh, talk. It wasn't just, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't just a day at the fair. This was the difference between them holding to their faith and their beliefs and in their worship and their relationship with God or abandoning their beliefs. When we go out into the world, the decisions that we make out into the world, those decisions are important. We're making decisions based on whether or not we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're making decisions based whether or not that our faith in Christ is real. We're making decisions as to whether or not what we say we have is real. It's not a game. It's not something to be played with. And when we look at this story of these men and we look at how they were willing to take a stand and how they were willing to be faithful and, and, and that their faith was important to them, I want to ask you a series of questions tonight. And again, don't answer these out loud unless you want to, but I just want to ask you a series of questions. You know, sometimes when you take a survey, they'll kind of start at the top and work their way down. And so I want you to grade yourself tonight. Based on what we've talked about, listen closely. How would you best describe your relationship with God? Here's your choices. Choice number one, how would you describe your relationship with God? Active, vibrant, and close. Number two, growing, and I'm heading in the right direction. Number three, it has been better. My relationship with God is kind of stale, and I'm in an unproductive uh, place. Number four, non-existent. I don't have a relationship with God. You grade yourself on those. Let me, let me give them to you one more time. How would you describe your relationship with God? Would you describe your relationship with God tonight as active, vibrant, and close? Would you say, 
my, Brother Tim, my relationship with God is growing and I'm heading in the right direction. Or would you say, well, Brother Tim, it's, it's been better. <laughs> to be quite honest, it's kind of stale at where it's at and it's kind of in an unproduct, unproductive state. Or would you say non-existent, there is no relationship? If our relationship with God should be our primary concern, when we answer that question with one of those four answers, if we get anything less than the first two, we should be concerned. Now, if you can sit here tonight and say, Brother Tim, my relationship with God is vibrant. My relationship with God is close. Or you sit here tonight and you say, Brother Tim, I have a growing relationship with God and I feel like that I am headed in the right direction. L let me just, let me give you a pat on the back. Let me give you praise. Let me say, God bless you and you keep working and you keep doing whatever you're doing. But if you're sitting here tonight and you would say, well, to be quite honest, Brother Tim, my relationship with God has been better. There's been days gone by where my relationship was better than what it is tonight. Or maybe you sit here and you say, my, my relationship with God is, is stale. It's just kind of unproductive. It's, it's, I'm not really moving forward or backward. I, but I, let me correct you. Let me correct myself on that. If you're not moving forward, you are moving backward. And certainly if you sit here tonight and say, Brother Tim, it's non-existent. There is no relationship. Then you've got work to do. Their faith was their primary concern. It was more of a concern to them than their politics. You know, we're getting into the campaign stage. It's not going to be long. And, and, uh, and I know I, I'm not supposed to say this from the pulpit, uh, but if y'all don't like it, go tell somebody on me. Uh, Tammy got me a big old Trump flag. Uh, and I can't wait to put that thing out on my front porch and wave that big old Trump flag. Amen? I think that thing's about a 20 by 30. No, it ain't that big, but it, it's a big old Trump flag. And I can't wait to put it out on my porch and, and, and wave it and everything and all of that stuff. And man, if you want to get somebody riled up, you just start talking about their politics, right? Start talking about their politics. But you know what? When I read the stories here in the book of Daniel, I find that to these young men, their faith was, to, was more important to them than their politics. Their faith was more of a primary concern than their careers. Nebuchadnezzar had plans for these young men. He wanted to bring them in. He wanted to assimilate them into the Babylonian culture and he wanted to use their intelligence. He wanted to use their talents. He wanted to assimilate them in and they could simply move up the ladder but their faith in God was more important than their career. It was more important than money. It was more important than relationships. It was more important than their social life. Let me say this. It was more important than life itself. Their relationship with God was more important than life itself. How do you get that, Brother Tim? They were thrown into a fiery furnace. They were thrown into a den of lions. For their faith and their beliefs, they were willing to stand up against the law, against the most powerful man on the face of the earth at that time by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. My friend, their faith, their relationship with God was more of a concern to them than anything else, even their own life. What about your faith? You know, as a pastor, as your pastor, do you know that I worry about your daily walk with God? I do. I think about you. I come to the church during the week. Brother Josh comes. And I know that we pray here on Sunday mornings and stuff before church ever gets started. We've been telling you about that. And I, I still wish more of you would come and, and, and join in with us. But I know where most of you sit. 
Some of you move around on me. I had some that usually sit over here this morning that moved over here, and I was totally confused. I didn't know whether to preach that way or to preach that way. I, 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 you know, and I was like confused here. But I know where most of you sit or the general area. And I come in here during the week, and I lay my hands on these pews, and I pray over these pews. And I say, Lord, you know who sits here. You know Miss Barbara sits here. You know Keith and Edie, they sit right here. And I come through here, and I pray. And do you know I'm concerned about your daily walk with God? I care about what kind of a day you're having at school or at work. I care about the fact that you had a doctor's appointment this morning. And man, when you go to the doctor anymore, it's just, a, it's just who knows, right? Who knows what you're going to find out anymore. And so I pray for you. And I, I want you to have a good day. And I, and I pray good things for you. And I'm concerned about your relationship with God. When I see you start missing church, when I see you start missing different activities of the church or whatever, that concerns me. It bothers me. When I start seeing you not doing things that you would normally do, I get concerned about that. Why? I love you. I care for you. I'm your pastor. But your faith's got to be important to you. And you've got to take responsibility for your faith, for your walk, for where you stand with God. I can pray for you all day long. But unless you decide that you're going to take an interest in your faith and in your relationship with God, all the prayers in the world is not going to fix the situation. So we go back to that question, how would you rate your faith? I want us to bow our heads tonight and I want to ask Keith to come. For some of you, your faith matters very little. You go about your week and it matters very little. For some, your, your faith matters so little, you actually struggle just to attend church on a, on a, on a semi-regular basis. But I want you to ask yourself the question tonight. How would you best describe your relationship with God? Vibrant, Brother Tim. My relationship with God is vibrant and it's, it's active. I have a close relationship with God. B, Brother Tim, my relationship is growing. I'm headed in the right direction. C, it's been better. It's kind of stale. I'm kind of in an unproductive place. D, non-existent. You don't have a relationship with God. Friend, if you can't answer that with an A or a B, you give yourself a grade of a C or a D. Why wouldn't you just slip out tonight and come down to the altar and say, God, I'm ready to raise my grade. I'm ready for my faith to take a greater part of my life, to be closer to you to have a closer walk with you, to have a relationship with you. Tonight, if your faith is stale, if you know there's a time in your life when you, were a, you had a closer walk with God and you had a, a more joyful spirit in your, in your salvation, why would you not come tonight and say, God, I lay that before you. I give that to you. I want to have that active relationship, a vibrant, close relationship. Or at least to be able to say that you're growing and heading in the right direction. While we wait just a minute, will you come? If this speaks to you tonight about your faith, where you are with God, friend, just step out and come tonight. It's not between you and anybody else in this room. It's between you and God. It's about you in your relationship with Him. I'll ask you this tonight. I'm, I'm kind of nosy like this. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody look around. Would there be anybody here tonight say, Brother Tim, I failed the test. My grade is a C or a D. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand? Would you be honest enough to say, Brother Tim, in, in the choices that you gave, I didn't make the grade. Would you lift your hand? 
God bless you. Are there others? Are there others? Friend, I hope you're being honest with yourself. I hope you're being honest with God. He already knows your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you for these young men. Thank you, Lord, for their example of their faith to us. Thank you, Lord, that they were willing to stand against law, education, social life, an ungodly environment, that they were willing to take a stand against it all because their faith meant something to them. Their relationship with you meant more to them than life itself. Help us, Lord, these many years removed from Daniel, these many years removed from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Lord, help us to learn from those young men and may our faith in God be strong that we would be willing to take a stand regardless of what it may cost us. We love you tonight, Lord, and we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. As you go out this week, ask yourself the question, how important is your faith? How important is your faith? The Bible tells us to be a light in the darkness, to let our light shine, to let our candle shine. It tells us to go out and to be Christ to others, that we are His ambassadors. And I hope that you'll do that tonight. Let's stand. God bless you. Good to see you. Remember the announcements that we've made. I know there was a lot of information thrown at you today about different things. Pick up the prayer calendar, if you will, and remember that that start next week. And uh, 30 days of prayer and praise. And I hope that you will uh, stick to that. Uh, and then um, coming up, and I'll make sure I get my date right. Two weeks from tonight, September the 8th, we will be having the ordaining service for uh, two of our deacons. And we'll be having a meal and stuff after the service. And so uh, we'll be announcing more about that and hope that you'll come support these men uh, as we ordain them uh, into um, deacons of the church. And uh, we'll have a time of celebration and stuff to go along with that. So that's two weeks from tonight, September the 8th. All right? God bless you for being here. And uh, remember, our service is Wednesday night. Let's bow our heads and we're going to be dismissed. And uh, Brother Martin, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer tonight?